So I want to start by thanking people because one of the things that happens because I'm the only person who really steps out in public to represent the collective, a lot of people sort of think that I am the collective. I'm not. I'm actually kind of the least important person in the collective. I get to come brag about what all these amazing people that I'm lucky enough to get to work with do. And so I know they're all out there. I know they're watching from all over the world. And it's just important for me to remind all of you that uh, if you see something that's awesome and applaud, you're applauding for them. And if I bow, I'm bowing on their behalf. So. Um, the other thing that is important to put out at the, at the outset, you know, before the plague, we were kind of the only people who were ranting and raving about health stuff and suggesting that there are alternative ways to go about it. And um, some people have some feelings about how some people have conducted themselves around the current plague. And to differentiate ourselves in the way we think about how people should manage their own health, it is paramount for us to state at the outset that we're not saying you should do anything in particular. We found some things that we think are cool, and we think they're worth taking a look at. And you should make a decision for yourself as to whether you think it's good for you, for your risk profile, for your body type, for any number of variables, your philosophy, for how you'd like to manage your own health. Managing your own health is a human right. It's a very important human right. We believe it's the first, because if you don't have your health, it disallows you access from managing all of the rest of your rights. It doesn't deprive you of your life necessarily if you're dead. It does, however, if you're sick, it deprives you of being able to interface with all of the things that make life meaningful. And then the third thing that, whoa, what happened? Oh, thank you. Um, the other thing that, that's important to mention is that we don't invent anything. We don't really do research and development. What we do is we look at things that are on the shelf, technologies that are established, things that have either been neglected or not pushed through or that are too expensive, and then we hijack them. So we're not coming up with a new idea and saying, hey, wouldn't this be cool? We're looking at cool ideas that other people had that you can't get for whatever reason. So with that, I'd like to state the following. I am, again, so happy to be here with all of you. And I swore off virtual talks because they were so frustrating to look out into just a little dot on my screen. And if all we're doing is trying to do this again, uh, I, don't, I don't see the point. I want to make sure that this is as interactive as possible. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. In the interest of doing things backwards, I want to chat. We're all here. That's what makes this special. So to remember how important it is that we need to seize what we've got, I'd like to take questions first. And here's how I'd like to do it. I want people to come up. Um, I, I guess there are microphones that can be handed around. Here in the back you see somebody waving a, a microphone. and. Um, They'll come around if you put your hand up. And I want to spend a few minutes, and I want to know what everybody's interested in. It's very easy to sort of run a, an independent research program and hang out with people who have their heads in the game and think about what we think would be cool. But if the whole point is that we're a public health organization, we need to know what everybody else thinks is important. Um, so we're going to do, if I can get the selector switch to work as it's supposed to, I. Here we go. So if you're shy about having the microphone, you can also go to this website and use this code. And any word that you put in should pop up on this screen. And hopefully, after we chat for a few minutes, we will know about what sort of medicines you're interested in 
hijacking or using or getting access to, and what sorts of illnesses or ailments that you think are underrepresented or need more attention um, in terms of the medical sphere. So let's start with questions. Anybody have something in mind? Over here, yes. Well, j just take it, I don't, I don't hear very well. All right, real quick question, uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, women's autonomy and the application of how we can actually uh, give women autonomy in states that may not allow them to have autonomy. Okay, cool. Can somebody um, type that in so it goes up there? Thank you. Who else? Who's there? Can, uh, in the back. Okay. This is more, yes. of, a, uh, this is more of a general question. Um, how can like an average like attendee here get involved with your organization? Yeah, well, well, we will certainly get to that. Um, we have, uh, on our website, we have a contact us page. Um, and if you'd like to volunteer, there's a specific email address that you can go in for um, volunteering. Um, yeah, and, and we are always looking for more people, um, especially every single one of you. So please, yeah, get in touch. Um, yeah, or, oh, and yeah, there one in the back and then one here in the front, yeah. Uh, uh, you put up a YouTube video, or not just on YouTube, but a video uh, a couple years ago about how to make your own abortion pills and pressing the pills. Yes. Are you going to distribute any information or have any ideas about distributing that stuff, since that's kind of the harder part of the equation? Yeah, important question. Yeah, if somebody would throw that up there, that's, uh, that's, that's something we definitely should talk about. Um, yeah, cool. And then, right, there was one up here. Yes. Yeah, so there's nootropics on there, but um, I'm interested in nootropics combinations because how do you stack things and uh, what synergizes with others and what doesn't? Okay, cool. Thank you. Again, can s somebody make sure this ends up in our word cloud? This is so pretty. Um, uh, thanks to the fellow who did this for us again. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. There. Oh, hey there. Hey, buddy. Hey. Um, so speaking of uh, neurotropics and stuff like that, do you guys also focus on enhancements, not just health, such as like maybe myostatin or folostatin inhibitor or something like that? Ooh, yeah. Okay, yeah. W um, there are there are a handful of enhancement things that we have had in the. The interesting thing about enhancement, I'll just say this in between questions, is that mm, philosophically, I don't differentiate between therapy and enhancement. Uh, again, it's. It kind of comes out of the anti-ableism space, where it's like, what is enhancement? What is therapy? What is normal? So anything that makes things better, uh, that qualifies as a medicine. So yeah. Hi. I would like to know more about how to gauge the efficacy of uh, adaptogens, specifically like mushroom adaptogens. Ooh, all right. Yeah, that's a good one as well. Somebody throw that up there as well? OK, cool. All right, uh, I, maybe one or two more. We're, we're, getting a good, we're getting a good stack here. I love the way it dances. One more? Okay, cool. We'll do one more. All right. Yeah. Um, I just want to plus one. Oh, sorry. I just want to plus one uh, the immune, autoimmune uh, item that's up there, especially since sometimes the interventions aren't necessarily profitable, so they might be something that lend themselves to DIY because there's not a lot of medical research into that. So like Lyme disease and other immune, autoimmune stuff. Great, thank you. Okay, cool. So here's how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna take a look at this. I'm gonna try and see what we have in terms of things that I can address right now. I've got two, three, four, five, six. Um, okay, and then um, hopefully this will stay. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> All right, well. I mean, I don't, I don't mean it'll stay like this. I just mean like it won't go away. And, and here's the thing. What, what we'll do is anything that we don't have for, we will put on the stack. Now, there's a long list of things that we, you know, are trying to address, but there's, uh, there's a lot. So let's take a look here. Um, well, DIY medicine encompasses everything we do, so that's pretty good. Uh, yeah. Seems like abortion's a big one. We should probably talk about that, right? Yeah? Okay, all right, we'll do that. Um, uh, HRT, that's a, we have something for that in the pipeline. 
Um, that also falls under the steroids category, uh, trans stuff. Oh, Roe v. Wade, okay, that ties in. Um, Self-experimentation. Uh, for that one specifically, the talk that we gave at uh, last year's DEF CON gives a good system for doing an N equals one trial. Um, and diagnosage info, ooh, okay, we're gonna have to talk about that one. Gene therapy, that one's hard, um, but not impossible. Autoimmune, definitely wanna talk about that. Okay, cool. Um, nootropics, uh, cost, of course, that's in everything. Um, injury repair, ooh, yeah, that's a hard one. That's a hard one, um, but not impossible. Okay, cool. All right, I think we have a table of contents for our talk. Let's, uh, let's, let's go. Uh, let me just adjust one or two things here, and I should switch over, and this should be coming up. Uh, come on. There we go. Okay, so uh, first thing that I'll introduce that falls under a lot of the categories that were up there in terms of DIY stuff is the new tools. We have a new stack of tools. The Microlab was sort of our flagship project and has been for a long time, and we have a new version of it. But what's really cool is not that we have a new version of the Microlab, but that we have a whole software suite of stuff that's uh, live and available that makes this easier to use. Because in the early days, it was kind of like, hey, we did a project, and you could too if you wanted to go through all of this pain. But um, so some of the new things about the Microlab is that there's this nice, cute little touch screen. It doesn't require another computer. Um, you don't have to solder anything. Everything is screw terminals or snap together. So it's, it's very easy to assemble. Um, we had a video of it at one point where I think one of our hardware guys assembled it in something like you know, 20 minutes. It was, it was really cool. But again, the hardware itself, the way it works, hasn't changed a whole lot. For those of you who are unfamiliar, it's an automated uh, chemical reactor that you can build yourself with off-the-shelf components, and it will help you through chemical synthesis. If you're looking for an API, you can do this. Now, again, this is small molecule chemistry, so if you're trying to make something like uh, an enzyme, that's a whole different monster. But it, if something is small enough that you can draw the molecule on a napkin, then it's accessible. Now, of course, the question has always been like, well, all right, that's fine, but how do you run the thing? So this takes us to uh, one of our newest pieces of software that is so exciting, <laughs> which is, it's called the Recipe Press, and this is live. Um, it's accessible on our website, and I should be able to jump over and actually use it. But what it does is it allows you to generate a file that the hardware will run. Previously, you had to code it hard, and it's like, yeah, you know, sort of like Python, and of course, for I imagine for most people in this room, that's not a big deal, but the goal is trying to increase access. One of the key things is trying to make things less technical so you don't have to know how to code. So this is a nice system of pull-down menus where you can just muck around, and I'll show that in a minute. Um, you can go through and just, if you have a procedure for manufacturing a molecule, you just create a step for each one. Uh, in the pull-down menu, it allows you to do uh, whatever you want. It, and again, you can control temperature, you can stir, you can uh, have the syringe pumps push reagents into the reaction chamber, you can have it wait for a certain amount of time, and you can also have it prompt the user. And this is a really important thing that I think is critical. When we talk about automation, right, it's a marriage of having a human and a machine work together. You want the machine to do the things that are easy for a human to screw up, and you want the human there checking the things that a machine won't understand. And so one of the best things about this is that it has a branching process. So you can say, Ask the user, is the solution still cloudy, or is it now clear? And again, it's like, it's still cloudy? Then it can then iterate. It's like, you just need to stir for longer. You can put that in, and you can have a decision tree in the system. This one's super awesome. I know uh, some of you remember us trying to hijack this years ago, and we finally did it, and it's so much fun. There was a group called Chematica that 
we tried to do business with very, very early on. They were very quickly absorbed by Merck, and their technology is now on a shelf somewhere. But what they did was very, very clever. They essentially utilized data science to try and figure out new ways to synthesize molecules. The first way is it combs through all of the history of all of the chemical literature that's out there. And what it does then is, um, so this is live, but like, just give it a minute. If everybody logs on right now, like, it, it'll just lock up. Theoretically, it should queue, and that does work, but one of our chemists at one point put in a molecule that he had worked on for his master's thesis, and it maxed out every core for a full 12 minutes. So if you're one of those people who likes to stress test, just like, wait a day, please. Um, so it'll crawl through all the history of all of the chemical literature and look for things related to your compound. It can then go combinatorially and try and figure out the bits and pieces of a way to get from A to B. If that's not there, you can utilize another module, and it will actually hypothesize. And the coolest thing that I love so much is that you can just cut and paste a SMILES code. So a SMILES code is an alphanumeric string, like an ASCII string, that um, uniquely identifies a molecule. If you pick your favorite molecule off of Wikipedia, and then you scroll down in that rightmost column, down at the bottom, there'll be a thing that says Show Smiles. You click that, and that'll pop up, and you can copy-paste it in. And again, this is right here, and I will show it in just a minute, but then this one I really love. There's actually a system to help you through. It actually can get into each of the pieces of software and help you work through it. I'm a fan. Uh, I love what our people did with this. So um, let's switch over and we'll take a quick look here. So this is what Vinny looks like um, in the flesh, as it were. So here you're seeing the interface. And there's Vinny up there saying hello. Um, Vinny's with a single eye at the end. Just, you know, oh, there we go, yeah. Um, and you can go through, and this will allow you to interface with any of these modules that I just described. Here you can see new compound smiles. You can literally just cut and paste there. And then you can work through and build yourself uh, a recipe. From here, so here, um, and this one I think is preloaded. If I click this here. There we go. And this is what it looks like. So again, we couldn't make one on the fly. I really wanted to, but this is what it will look like once you do this. And you can go through, and each of this is a total graphical user interface. You click on things, and you can change, and it will give you options for which things you want to do, and if you need a branching or looping in the structure. And then it'll output a file. And that file you can then load on the microlab, and you can just run it, which uh, I think is amazing, and I'm just so pleased with everybody who's been working on this. And again, this is, um, you can see this here, it is live, you can go and play with it right now if you want. Um, I'm just going to go back one and then show the other angle of this, assuming everybody hasn't overwhelmed it. Can I go back? Maybe? Maybe? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat here. Um, this will take a moment to load, but here's Chemhactica. This is so much fun. So from here, it has a number of tools, and I can't even get through all of them, but these allow you to not just try and develop a pathway for synthesizing a molecule, you can also set parameters. If you want the precursors to be commercially available, uncontrolled, below a certain price, uh, non-toxic in certain categories, you can do that. Also, it will allow you to, again, it will hypothesize if you let it. It'll make some good guesses, and it will say what you're looking for. So again, this is, uh, this is where you would probably start. And what you can do is right here where it says target, you can just paste in 
uh, the smiles code for a molecule. So I'm going to try and do this. We'll see if this works. Whoops. Um, here we go. So we'll just pick, we'll pick a drug. Um, did I spell it right? I think it's amine. Amine? There we go. Medication, clofazamine. All right, so there you can see on the upper right is the chemical structure. And down here, smiles, you click show, and here's this alphanumeric string. I'm just going to grab it. And what operating system am I running? Okay, and then go back over, and hopefully I can paste this in. And when you click one step, what it looks for is one pot shots, where you can literally do a single reaction and get it to work. All right, there we go. So we've got three options already. So here, you can see they're color coded. I haven't done this molecule before, so we're just, we're just playing. But here, the green one indicates that this already exists in the literature. The blue one indicates that it exists in the literature, but not directly. And the red one suggests that this pathway does exist, but the precursors are not commercially available. This is one of my coolest, uh, one of my favorite features here, is you double click this, and then you say expand node. And what it'll do is it'll run the same thing on that one. And it's doing this in real time, OK? So this is a server that's in a secure, undisclosed location that is taking care of this. And as you can see, it's like it's thinking. This takes a little time for it to draw out everything and figure out how this works. And you can continue to iterate this process. And utilizing this, you actually have a pathway from, oh, I have something that I want to make through to how do I get from point A to point B? And then how do I make a file that will then run on the hardware? And you can actually make it. I'm pretty thrilled. So again, ma massive hats off to all of our developers who came up with all of this stuff. It is so, so fun. Um, and it's fun just to mess around with, too. So again, uh, if you're excited, like, yes, please use it, but just give us, g g give me another 35 minutes, OK, so it doesn't crash. Um, all right. So. Um, Vinny here has some functionality, but we are like to give him a little more. Did I, did I press that? Huh? Come on. Um, right now, one of the things that we are trying to build into Vinny is the ability to help you through the research process. Um, doing, doing research where you um, that's beautiful, but not what I was dreaming of. Um, yeah, huh? there we go. Okay, cool. Um, so currently, Vinny kind of just helps you utilize each of the different pieces of the software. It sits in a, it's, it's sort of an uh, umbrella um, piece of software. But these things in yellow, we're in the middle of doing. And they're not quite ready yet. But again, not everybody is used to reading scientific literature. It's not, it's not super easy. So one of these things that can be done is it crawls through. It looks for things that have code words or keywords uh, associated with some of the things that you're trying to search for. And it will go through and actually uh, check to see what's out there. And it will give you a precy, a one sentence, for each of the papers. And then it gives you a list. And each of the ones that look interesting, you can click, yes, I'd like to do this one, and this one, and this one. And then it'll go through and um, uh, scrape Sci-Hub, um, our dear friends at Sci-Hub. Um, and it'll zip it up and send them to you. Now, these yellow ones, these are not live yet, but we're working on them. Um, so again, that, sh that helps the, the antecedent process of what drug do I need, or what drug might I want. So, OK. Um, this one was not in anybody's request. So there's a little uh, lack of overlap here. But 
this one was one that we've been working on for a long time. Um, out of hospital cardiac arrest is, you know, uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so just slumps over at the dinner table and what's wrong? Well, you know, you, it's hard to say because they're just non-responsive and not breathing and you probably don't have tools to work with it. Probably the biggest magic wand that exists in critical medicine is the defibrillator, the automatic external defibrillator. It's very simple and you've all seen it. There are two pads that you stick on and it goes through, it takes an EKG of your heart and determines if you're in one of these states. One of these states is either that things are out of sync or your valves are just kind of fluttering. If that happens, it will identify that and administer a shock. If it does that, then typically, in many cases, the heart will just restart. And you can search YouTube and find just the most incredible videos of somebody just grabbing an AED off a wall, sticking it to somebody, and a minute later they wake up and say, why am I on the floor? Like, they're literally okay afterwards, unlike other situations where things are more critical. In these two cases, it just goes away. But only if you have a defibrillator and you get it to the person in a short amount of time. You can look at a graph and there's this, this, these crashing numbers that if, you, you know, the recovery rate is very high for short periods of time. And once you get past nine minutes, the likelihood of survival is very, very low. And as you get closer, the likelihood of brain damage is very, very high. So the solution is, is that everybody should have one in their car and in their house. No brainer, right? But there's a glitch. Here's the glitch. These are the cheap ones, by the way. <laughs> so, none of us ever expects that our heart is just going to stop, uh, or very few people at least, and to shell out so much money for something that you think you're unlikely to ever use is, uh, is a tall order. So, uh, how do you fix this? Well, you make one yourself, right? Um, no problem. Well, it's, it's complicated. Uh, we had this idea a long time ago and kind of shelved it because it seemed like it was uh, prohibitively difficult. But luckily, we came across a group in Italy who did this in 2017. And we called them up and said, hey, can we partner with you? We love what you did. The Ubora project is designed as an open medical hardware platform for deployment in sub-Saharan Africa. And when they wrote the platform, they wanted a test case. And so the test case that they did was this guy, Jacopo Ferretti, and he wrote his master's thesis on designing an open source AED. And he did a great job. It's amazing. It's very thick and it's a fun read. Um, and the entire second chapter is devoted to the fact that if you wanted to, you could actually push it through the regulatory process. It meets every regulatory requirement in North America, South America, and the EU, and I think there was a regulatory group in Asia as well. I don't remember which. Um, but it's this amazing design. So we said, hey, we'd like to set this up and just do a new version, because they didn't really deploy it. It wasn't out there. It was just sort of a proof of concept, and they let it be. Um, so let's see if I can show it to you. This is a DeWalt toolbox, and we decided we just put a sticker on it. <laughs> and here's the inside. Oh, sorry, the key thing to mention, all of the parts, all inclusive, only cost $600. And somebody, and this is not a beginner's project, anybody looking at this will know, this shouldn't be your first electronics project if you've never soldered before, but if you know how to do things, and you've, you know, you've built a few kits, it shouldn't be that hard. Also, uh, I imagine some of you are noticing the sticker on that giant capacitor on the upper left there. Um, that's that sticker. <laughs> that sticker is on a 140 microfarad capacitor rated at 1800 volts. You charge that up to 1600 volts and that's what actually gives you the shock that you need. So, 
Here are each of the different systems. The battery system has two power supplies. One is low voltage to uh, power the computer and the audio system and push the square wave. The high voltage charging circuit uh, gets power from a different circuit off the batteries and that pumps charge into the capacitor. The relay system is the thing that kicks it on when it needs to dump either into a waste resistor or actually into the pads. And the H-bridge system, this is what creates the biphasic shock. When you shock somebody to start their heart again, you have to shock in one direction, then turn around and shock back the other way. So you have to have something that can do that halfway through the capacitor discharging. We'll see that in just a second here. Um, so this is a system on a chip. It's a very sophisticated system. I know some of you understand what all this means. It's cool. And what this does is this um, allows you to load the code that will take the EKG and it will essentially run a finite state machine and decide if a shock needs to be administered or not. And if not, it will also give you audio prompts. It'll tell you to not panic and to call emergency services and to continue CPR and to you know do all of those bits and pieces. Um, Here's the finite state diagram that actually tells you about how each piece goes around and it measures. It will say, don't touch the patient. You'll wait. It will do a little diagnostic and then it will continue to give you instructions, either to give a shock or it gives a shock. It's a fully automatic AED. It's not the ones where you have to press the button. It'll say, stand clear of the patient. Don't touch the patient. And then it'll administer the shock or it will just tell you to continue CPR. Or in the case that you don't have anything wrong, it will tell you that a normal heartbeat is detected. I, we actually have this unit back at our Airbnb and I really lobbied the group. I said, what if we just stop my heart and then we could start it again? And they're like, it doesn't work that way. You have to be in VTAC or VFib. And I was like, oh right, so how do we induce that? And they said, no, we're not doing that. Um, I thought it would have been fun, but such as it is, um, I'm just showing you a graph. This is what a normal heartbeat looks like, more or less, when you plot it in phase space. Now, you're used to seeing little things that blip along. So if you do transformation, you can see this pattern is readily discernible. This is the sort of thing you can teach to a machine very easily. If it sees this, this is a normal heartbeat. If it instead sees this, this means things are bad news. And so the way that the algorithm works is that it will sweep out the internal area created by these curves. And if it's above a certain threshold, then it knows that it's in this mode and says it needs a shock. Um, there's, this is the one for, I believe, ventricular tachycardia. The fibrillation looks slightly different. But again, these are things that are easy for a machine to notice. So, of course, you know, when you're putting your hands, uh, your life in the hands of a machine, you want to, like, how does it know? This is easy for a machine to determine. It's, uh, it's fairly simple. So then here, this is the H-bridge that I spoke about a moment ago in terms of flipping. So this is sort of a, what a generic H-bridge looks like. Um, our H-bridge, right, so, and this is the discharge. So this is what it looks like, the capacitor up from there, and then it switches over and dumps the rest going back the other way. And, yeah. And this is what the actual circuit for the H-bridge looks like. Um, that's why you saw it was all of those many modules together, because it has to do this complicated switching, and it has to do it for very, very high voltages. So, as you can see, there are opto-isolators and relays, and it's, uh, uh, it's all pretty, pretty cool. Um, again, I'm really impressed with everything that everybody's done. Um, so this is, this is kind of the key piece, though. I'm sure you saw how tiny those little batteries are. Yeah, there's an array of them, but how do you get a tiny little battery to, in a very short period of time, push a huge amount of charge into a very, very large capacitor? Well, um, those of you who are familiar will recognize this as a fairly generic flyback circuit, and this is basically what we run. It's slightly more complicated than this because there's tuning involved, but this is what the skeleton looks like. What you're doing is you're pumping a square wave into uh, two gain stages. So there are actually two transistors on the left there. One kicks it up, one kicks it up again, and then you run it through a flyback transformer and you have this diode, and in our case there are actually two or 
three, depending on which version we did, um, that create it, and the thing charges up really fast. Um, I have video of it that I will eventually post. The first time that I got it to work, I was really surprised because it hadn't been working for a while. And, um, and then when I pushed it to dump into the power resistor, the power resistor exploded. Um, so, and, and another time, another guy was testing it, and he, it is this most incredible video because his multimeter actually jumped off the bench because one of the uh, copper traces vaporized. It was, it was nuts to watch. Um, so that's the AED. It, it works just the same as a commercial unit. However, we were sitting around thinking and said, OK, well, it's as good as a commercial unit. How do we make it better? What's better than an AED? So we said, well, if you're in the hospital. So OK, that, well, that's complicated. If you're in a hospital, you've got a whole bunch of people attending to you. You call a code. You've got a respiratory therapist. You've got a pharmacist. You've got somebody monitoring your, your airway. You've got somebody who's reading your vitals. You've got somebody with a manual defibrillator who's making a decision as to how they're going to run it. These things are difficult. When somebody mentioned the whole problem of diagnosis, diagnosis is probably the most difficult thing in all of medicine and is often gotten wrong. Diagnosis is very, very difficult. But we asked the question, of the things that are done, what can we add in that doesn't require diagnosis or any special training? And nicely, there are two things that you can do that are fairly easy. And the first one is you can just give a blast of air. Now, um, this is an off-the-shelf unit. And you'll see it here. This is how big this thing is. And you can throw it in with your AED. It's a sports oxygen thing, which, by the way, is a total scam. <laughs> if you're in an aerobic state, you're running around, your blood's already totally saturated with oxygen. This will do nothing for you. However, if you have not been breathing and your oxygen saturation has been tanking, if somebody's there and the first rescue breath that they give you comes out of this, then it will increase your oxygen saturation in your blood and make it so that when you're doing the chest compressions, more oxygen will get to your brain and you're less likely to die while you're waiting for the EMTs to show up and the brain damage you are likely to incur will be less. Again, easy off the shelf solution. And then the other thing is that typically when you're being given CPR in a hospital, they give you vasopressin and epinephrine these both increase your blood pressure. This supports CPR. If your blood pressure is low and somebody's trying to do compressions on you, it's not getting anywhere. It's very, very hard. So if you can increase that chemically, it's very easy to do. Now, some of you who are familiar with this will say, well, wait a second, that's an IV. How are you going to set up an IV? Well, interestingly enough, there was a study shown that intramuscular epinephrine and intravenous epinephrine are about the same efficacy when trying to support CPR. So if you wanted to, you could, again, off the shelf, just throw in three EpiPens because you want a full milliliter of epinephrine. However, there was this problem with EpiPens. Does everybody remember? <laughs> so you can build your own. We've been doing this for a long time. This was like the big hit. A lot of people still come up to me, they're like, oh, you're the EpiPencil guy. And I'm like, well, we have done a few other things, but yes. Um, and we have a few of these. Um, is there anybody in the audience who suffers from anaphylactic shock? No, do I, anybody waving? Nobody? Would you like one? All right. Come take this one. It's, uh, so again, this is an auto injector, and it, it has a nice sticker on it. And um, yeah, here, here, I'll just pass it back. Um, and uh, we probably have one more if there's uh, anybody else who's uh, wants one. So in the event that you don't want to spend, uh, what is it, 650 times three to, to put three EpiPens in with your AED, you can just load this. And the benefit is also, if you're loading it with epinephrine, you can also load it with vasopressin and support CPR even more. OK. This is the big one that everybody was asking about. This is the one that was in, I don't know, very large font in some, some color. <sighs> this one bothers me. 
I mean, it bothers everybody, right? But it really bothers me from the perspective of public health because this is, this has a solution. You want to talk about off-the-shelf solutions, things that are totally fixable? This is totally fixable. There's no reason that there shouldn't be access to all of the reproductive health in the world. And most of these things come in pills. It's so, it, it, it's so simple and, and, and shouldn't be an issue that we have to talk about or fight for. Um, and so let's just, um, let's just go through some of them. Um, and saying they aren't that hard to get, it's figurative, okay? Like, I understand that now in this country, it's, it is hard to get, and totally unnecessarily. So we basically got um, four categories of ways that we can do birth control, and um, three of these come in pills, right? Um, at least one form. And so uh, f first line is fine, uh, again, for now. Like, this is still legal, which is fine. Um, and the pills are out there, and, and hopefully you have one that works with your body. And again, but you have to take it all the time, and you still have to go talk to an authority figure who will grant you permission to have some uh, uh, autonomy over your body, which doesn't sit terribly well with me. Um, and there's this one, and this one's in this interesting gray area um, because uh, apparently in certain jurisdictions this is not seen as different from abortions, but it has this interesting fact that it's just a single pill, and it is technically still over the counter. Now, people think about Plan B, right? That's, that's a brand name, but there is this um, off-brand called My Way that you can get off of Amazon, and a month ago, they were $6, and now they're, I think, $18. Um, but this is over the counter. You can just order it, and it's um, still available for now. Uh, interesting point of fact, it has a three-year shelf life. Um, let me see, um, could, could we bring the house lights up just a touch so I can kind of take a rough count? So uh, let me ask one question. Um, who maybe wants one of these for a rainy day? N nobody? Everybody's just cool? Okay, here. Um, but I was, I was looking here, and I think, I think, uh, oh, a bunch of people just filed into the back. I might have enough for everybody. <laughs> um, interesting point of fact also, this box is mostly empty. It's one pill, again, in a blister pack that of theoretically five, that uh, the four are empty because it's only a single pill. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe we should just pass them around. Right? I mean, who, who wouldn't want this for a rainy day or knows somebody who might want one for a rainy day? I mean, here we go. I got a, I got a whole box. Here we go. Just, uh, just come up and grab one whenever you want. Um, and when we were looking at this, um, again, we're always thinking, how can we improve things? Uh, looking at emergency contraception is probably not the only problem that you're dealing with. Um, wouldn't it be nice to also have something that protected against HIV? Well, there is post-exposure prophylaxis. So why couldn't you just bundle them? Well, there's a slight problem. We looked into this, and unfortunately, there are two problems. And the, which, yes, post-exposure prophylaxis in its, like, regular form, if you're a health worker and you have a um, needle stick problem, you, you go through a month of fairly heavy antiretrovirals. And then the other problem is that the two actually interfere with each other. If you look, if you took one of these boxes, you'll see on the back that it says if you're taking antiretrovirals for HIV, you should talk to your doctor before taking it. Okay, so those are problems. Can we fix them? And the answer is absolutely we can. And the wonderful things are that, oops, I apologize for this. Um, the two things that need fixing. Uh, first, the fact that they interfere with each other. 
and um, the other one being that you have to take it for a month. The first dose of the antiretrovirals does something like 90 plus percent of the work. The rest is just to make sure. So if you want to be really sure, then yes, you need to dose yourself for an entire month. And again, it's all a numbers game. Both of these medications just reduce the likelihood that these things will go wrong. They don't guarantee it at all. And wonderfully enough, there was a symposium last year that showed that if you just double the dose of the plan B, you can take it with an antiretroviral and it will still be effective. So if you were to say, bundle those two, like this, where you have two plan B and an antiretroviral in a little baggie that's sealed. I sealed these myself last night. This is what we call plan B plus. And again, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it does make these sorts of things less likely. Because if you're worried about potentially getting pregnant, you may also be worried about contracting HIV. So who wants one of these? Wait, again, how many people are out there? Because because I got a lot. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't have like things to like dole these out with, but like there's, here, hang on, I've, I've got a lot. Like I've got, hang on, how many, how many do I have? I didn't, ca wait, here, there's, how, how many does this theater hold? Because I'm wondering, I think, because I think that there's a, a hundred here, maybe, maybe just shy of a hundred. We've got a lot. Um, I'm just gonna throw more on the floor, and if people wanna come up and get more, here we go. There you go, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, there are more to be had. <laughs> um, so that particular antiretroviral is, I'm, I'm going to butcher the, uh, the technical names, but it's Truvada. So it's a single pill of Truvada that's stolen in with the two Plan B pills. Um, so, uh, again, uh, hopefully nobody will need it, but again, there they are if you do need them. And again, the, the, the reason this bothers me is because it's, this shouldn't be a problem. You know, this should be available. Um, so then, let's, let's go to the next, right? Medicated abortion. This is the thing that, like, all abortion activists know about. You have mifepristone and you have misoprostol. Um, misoprostol works on its own very effectively. You take three doses of it, it's pretty simple, but again, it's very hard to get. Um, so uh, how do you solve this problem? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not that hard to solve. All we do is we just go and buy a bunch. So you need to take 800 micrograms in three doses and you space them out. And uh, these, are, these are made. You know, you can, you can buy them from India. They're not hard to get. Um, this should solve the problem. And there are organizations that distribute these. We're not one of them. I just distribute them here because it's fun. Uh, right? But, like, it, it, this shouldn't be a thing, right? It, it, look, this little box of pills is your abortion in a box. Like, again, you know, I, I'm not going to say who wants this for a rainy day because people probably won't want to raise their hand. But, like, how many people are out there? Because uh, I got a lot. So I'll just leave those there. Um, and, oh, wait, 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 hang on. I put some more in baggies because I ran out of boxes. So there's some more. And again, hopefully nobody's ever going to need these. And me giving these out, again, it's, it's, it's fun, right? Like, I'm, I hope we're all having a, as much fun as I am doing this. But at Four Thieves, we're not focusing on how do we build infrastructure or supplant infrastructure that already exists. We don't want to be a gatekeeper any more than we see the existing gatekeepers. What we'd like to do is we'd like to show people how to make it themselves. And somebody was nice enough to mention that we had put together a video on how to make them yourself. There's some fairly simple ways that you can make tablets if you have misoprostol powder. This is this really cool little pill press. It takes nothing more than the powder itself and a hammer and a spray bottle, and you can make these tablets. But it's a pain. And you have to make tablets because they have to dissolve in your cheek. If you just swallow them, nothing happens. 
right? They have to dissolve. So is there a better way? Yes. And I'm very excited to show you what this better way is. Yeah, some of you are putting it together. So if you have, say, some active ingredient of uh, misoprostol. Oh, I don't have a glass up here. Oh, that's all right. I should be able to show this anyway. What you can do is just dissolve the misoprostol in it. One of the big problems with making those tablets is measuring it. 800 micrograms is very hard to measure. Even if you have it in a buffered tablet, okay, then have you mixed it properly? Is it homogenous? There are a whole host of problems that happen here. And if you get it, you can just dissolve it in um, Spiritus Polski, 96%. Uh, I bought this yesterday. Who, who drinks this? I, uh, I have enough for everybody. We'll pass this around when I'm done. Um, so I was hoping to show this uh, under camera, but it seems like we don't have one. But I can show you a picture of what I'm about to do. Um, this is a micropipette. Yeah, thank you. This is a micropipette, which you can see here. And what you do is if you dissolve the misoprostol in here, and again, this does not have misoprostol in it currently, but this is how this would work, is that you can merely, terrible pipetting technique, um, you drop the liquid, and then you can set how much liquid goes in, and then if you have, say, a piece of cardstock, then all you can do is dropper it on the way you would if you were making, say, I don't know, what else goes on paper? And this is all that it takes. And, um, and I'm doing this incorrectly, so those of you who actually know how to use pipettes are probably totally disgusted. But there's a, you would crank this down to 10 microliters, and then you put a little dose on each of the, let's dump that, um, on six little spots on a piece of paper, and you have something that's now no longer a tablet. And this is great because it can't be crushed. It can be sent through the mail and detected. And you don't have to deal with, hey, what are you carrying around? What are these pills? And you can hide it in plain view. And if you look, these are what the cards that I just dosed look like. And here's one up close. And you can take this business card, and you can cut it into six, and you tuck the first two in your cheeks, and that's your first dose. And you wait, and then you can do the second thing, the hours later, and then the third thing. And all you need to do, and if you, do you want, how many of these do you want to make? You can make hundreds, you can make thousands, and it's, it's just as easy as dissolving the powder in the solvent and then dosing it out. And I'm really hoping that this revelation is going to make some of us be able to say to a certain nine people that I won't name, yeah, it's just like your opinion, man. <laughs> so, of these, unfortunately today I don't have enough for everybody, but I do have a few of these cards. And on the front, you will see this, it says, this card is an abortion. It has a QR code where it take you to our website, just shows you how to take it. And then on the back uh, is this. So, I'll leave these here for now instead of just throwing them. But if anybody wants one, we will also have instructions so that if you want to make a bunch, you can. And how much would you want to make? Well, let's just play with some numbers, shall we? So there are about 6.1 million pregnancies in the US annually. According to the Guttmacher Institute, 18% of those are unwanted. If we just do a little bit of arithmetic here, we'll see this is a 1.1 million pregnancies that are unwanted. Three doses of 800 micrograms. That's what you get on a card. You want to multiply this out? This is just a, over two and a half kilos. This means that with just two and a half kilos, I mean, you've seen a kilo, just two and a half kilos, would actually cover every single unwanted pregnancy in America for the year. And for those of you who see me do my thing, I know the question you're asking is, 
so where are the two and a half kilos? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I dropped them somewhere. But you'll see them out there. We have a lot more things to show you. Uh, I'm so excited to be back. I hope to have conversations with everybody. Um, um, I'm showing that my time is up. Um, I had one other thing to show uh, that I was pretty excited about, but uh, we have dozens more. And what we'd really like to say is thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for supporting us over the years. Thank you so much for thinking about embracing your own health and helping other people. Um, again, we have a website. Uh, if you'd like to volunteer, as was asked, we have a volunteer contact. Um, if you have more money than time, we'd love donations because uh, we're having a hard time buying all these drugs. Um, not really. We're having a hard time with logistics, which is also very expensive. Um, and, um, and we'd love any help you could give. We'd love to hear more of these ideas of what people would like to work on and what people think should be worked on. And um, as I say, if you really like what Four Thieves is doing and you'd like to help the cause, go find somebody who needs your help and help them, whether you think they deserve it or not. Thank you so much. And because I We did have questions in the beginning of the talk. This was a little bit of an unusually arranged talk. I just want to say thank you for coming out. Just as a reminder, everybody, whether you call it 33 or 92, it is incredibly hot outside. Please make sure you stay hydrated.